we are going to talk about uh, something very exciting, another of our research projects. Um, if you think about web, uh, web is transforming uh, substantially. Uh, I said that before, but I will repeat, started with the web of docu uh, documents, it became web of data, and now the type of data has, cha has changed. Web 2.0 brought, brought in user-generated data, and we saw that in the military system. Now, there is the largest growth in the data on the web. Uh, well, well, they're coming from uh, they're coming from sensors. So mobile devices are generating a lot of data, but also sensors. And um, there's a term that is becoming very popular called Internet of Things or Web of Things. That is anything, any device uh, uh, can communicate or. Add they are increasingly communicating with uh, other devices and with uh, the web at large using IP protocols. Right? So we have um, the numbers vary. There was one number where it says there are uh, there going to be um, 40 billion devices by this time. Um, there are some other numbers that says well there will be so many billion devices by 2015 or 2020. Whatever the actual number may be, the number of devices in your uh, car, new cars particularly, uh, and uh, in your refrigerators, <coughs> in any consumer devices you buy, in the hi-fi equipment that can communicate on the IP have kept on increasing. Just like TVs have now uh, increasingly ability to pull in internet content, then increasingly the ability to even uh, transmit right, the content or information they, they can collect. So, uh, among the growth includes a lot of things around you, like weather sensors, a lot of things close to you, like the mobile devices and near field devices. So, you have electronic <laughs> payment. Uh, systems on your uh, mobile phone, particularly Android, is already has that square, for example. And uh, you have um, uh, sensors uh, that uh, take your heart uh, uh, pulse, for example, and or your heart rate constantly, and you wear them. There are uh, uh, there are uh, mesh available that you wear, and they collect your body, uh, your uh, vitals, and deliver that. Uh, so it's called body area networks. And they collect the data, and uh, there are sensors within you, and data are increasing at the number. So uh, again, that part is, is just starting now. The increasing number of sensor devices that are being implanted, or will be implanted, uh, into the human body. So within the body, on the body, and around us, the number of sensors are increasing. Very vastly. So the number of data that these things create has already outpaced any other form of data. Perhaps all the rest of forms of data are collected. So what can we do with that? How can we leverage and utilize this data? What kind of application can we do? That's something that um, uh, uh, Pramod is going to talk about in Cinematic Sensor that Project, which is a fairly decent project, very exciting project, links in mobile devices and sensors and semantic computing and all kinds of stuff we get. Thanks for uh, Hi, my name is Pramod. Uh, I'm a PhD student in the sector. Uh, I'm part of Semantic Sensor Project. Uh, so there are many people in the team and I'm just representing them to present the work that we have done. Uh, before I start up with what we do and what are the kind of details that are involved in each of the projects, I would like to situate this project in the overall vision uh, of our lab. And uh, that is uh, uh, computing for human experience. So we know that we have these billions of sensors, right, as Dr. Shep mentioned. And all these sensors are observing the physical environment. And they constantly collect uh, observations of different physical things and events and their state. So. The idea is we want these machines to kind of help us have a better experience in the sense that it should make us comfortable as opposed to we going to machines and explicitly uh, 
let's say, in, like, the, the conventional desktop kind of uh, applications, right? Where you actually go to the machine, you enter something, process the information, and get the results. So think about a paradigm where sensors actually would figure out what you want, and they collect observations, they process the information, and they actually act based on the processed information. So here the human is not explicitly involved in providing the input and getting the output, whereas the sensors that could actually figure out the context of the human and enhance the experience. All these projects that I talked about are kind of uh, situated in this vision. So we want these experiences to be kind of, we want this experience just to be uh, shared, remembered. So with social media, you share your experiences. Right? So similarly, you want to kind of enjoy the overall process of this whole experience. So as Dr. Sik mentioned, we have, we are surrounded by uh, different devices, uh, be it sensors or be it mobile phones, uh, or be it static sensors. So every room you might have seen, there are motion detectors, right? So with all these different computing devices, so as Dr. Sik mentioned the numbers, there are like 40 billion sensors that are connected on the web. And what are the, all these things are interconnected. So that's the major point. So just observing the environment and keeping it to so itself is one part. But if you're able to share these kind of observations across the web, so it brings in a lot of uh, uh, avenues for improvement. So we want to, the question is, can we leverage these kind of observations that are made by different devices and sensors which are monitoring the physical world. And in the process, we don't get lost. So there is this so much of data, right? So if you if you log into Twitter, for example, there are so many tweets, you probably would get lost with what exactly uh, you want. And similarly, think about sensors that have actually surpassed the amount of generation of data which surpassed the social media data like last year. So there's so much data, but very less insights. So we want to move to a human-centric kind of approach as opposed to machine-centric. That is, as I told you, with all these observations, what better can we do with the existing state of the affairs? So this whole holistic vision is what is the vision of our lab. And whatever projects I'm kind of going to show you in the next few slides are related to this vision. Uh, before I go, uh, I just want to mention, most of you might have heard of ubiquitous computing. So it's something like the computing devices getting embedded into different physical things uh, surrounding us. So gradually a laptop would kind of, the vision of ubiquitous computing is exactly this. So the laptop and other computing devices that are kind of visible to you would actually get embedded into invisible forms. So it would just be there, observe you, compute, and do whatever is required. And that's the kind of vision. So here comes the introduction to the semantic sensor. Um, so we spoke about many sensors. So there are sensors everywhere, including uh, outside monitoring. There's these satellites that actually take pictures of Earth and do some geological kind of surveys and things like that. So there are sensors outside the Earth monitoring the Earth. There are sensors within Earth monitoring the Earth. Um, so there are these traffic sensors. I don't know if you have noticed. So there are these kind of poles on the highways where there are sensors monitoring number of vehicles that are passing through a particular road. And there are sensors uh, to monitor structures. So for instance, if there are if there are physical structures, like for example, bridges and things like that which are critical. So there are sensors to monitor the health of those structures. And system health monitoring is one of the major areas of research. Uh, there are sensors monitoring uh, critical parameters of uh, firefighters and first responders, because their life is very important. Uh, there are many such uh, places where you can see sensors continuously monitoring uh, some entity. Maybe it's human or it may be uh, some physical structure. 
Further, all these sensors that are monitoring these different physical structures, the data by itself is kind of locked in in one place. So the idea is to see if we can let this data free. And what is the benefit of doing that? Uh, to give you a concrete example, let's say in case of traffic, right? So you have access to, let's say, traffic in uh, a particular city. So it's kind of opening up the data for the community so that people can make use of that data to build some cool applications. So in order to do that, right, so we need to set free the, uh, this whole data. But it's easy to say, let's set free all the sensor data. But looking at the scale that what Dr. has mentioned, it's like billions and billions of sensors. And those sensors are generating observations, let's say, at every second. So it would lead to a huge uh, collection of observations. So we need to come up with uh, efficient methods of discovering these sensors. That is, if I want to search for a sensor, I should be able to find those sensors. Uh, I should be able to uh, not only search, but also access their observations. That is, what observation is currently is making. So the integration and interpretation is one other important factor. Um, because when there is when there are different sensors, and there is heterogeneity in these uh, sensors, that is, one might be a temperature sensor, the other one might be a flow, so that is, detecting speed of vehicles and it, the other one might be a different kind of sensor. How do you integrate all these different heterogeneous sources of information? So that's the kind of question you may want to ask when you're trying to integrate these different sources of information. Good question. Yeah. So why is this data not free? Do the companies not know to make it free? Do they want to afford it themselves? Why is it not open to everybody? Yeah, both the reasons that you stated. One is, uh, kind of some of them are proprietary because some of the companies, they invest money in the sensor deployments. So they don't want uh, others to consume that data without paying anything. And the second one is some of them actually, they're not exposed to open data kind of skills that I'll be talking about. Not entirely, but I'll just mention it. Uh, that is, if you have so much of data, how can you actually publish it on the web? There are many challenges in that uh, arena. So I think those are the, both of them actually contribute to uh, companies not publishing the data. So this whole observing of the sen sensor web is an interesting uh, area. So you kind of, we spoke about different sensors, and now these different sensors being connected on the web, what are the different <coughs> challenges that we see? So enabling interoperability is one of the challenges that I just spoke about. And discovering is another aspect. That is, you should be able to find a sensor easily. So I, I need not, uh, for to give you an example, right? Let's say I want to access a temperature sensor near Wright Patterson Air Force Base, right? I, sh I need not go there and search for lack long or the sensors. And usually that is how sensors are kind of configured with the lack long and things like that. Think about going to an interface and just typing Wright Patterson Air Force Base, typing what type of sensor you want, just select it and get all the results. So that's the kind of um, uh, discovery that you want, and that's not. Uh, intuitive for humans to actually discover such uh, kind of sensor deployments. And by doing all this, uh, we have kind of, uh, between the cyber physical, this divide, what is it, what exists between cyber and physical kind of systems, right? So we are bridging this divide by deploying more sensors, uh, both in terms of scale, right? So we have a large number of sensors monitoring physical systems, so that's one of the uh, advantages. So why why do we even uh, need this sensor? Right? So I stated this reason already. And the second one is uh, situation aware. That is, I was talking to you about sensors kind of deployed in the physical objects in the world, right? So let's say 
there are sensors deployed in the physical objects just surrounding me. And it's kind of aware of my context. That is, whether I'm at school or whether I'm at home, or whether I'm feeling comfortable. Like for example, there might be some sensor that's uh, detecting, let's say, galvanic skin response. That is, based on the moisture content, it might say that if I'm sweating, I need a little more uh, AC. So things like that. So that's one of the reasons uh, why I'm uh, why semantic sensor work is important. So, in order to design <coughs> such uh, sensor work or semantic sensor work systems at a larger scale, we need to address uh, three important problems. Uh, the first one, integration. So, I kind of gave you a glimpse of what is the heterogeneity that's involved, right? So, think about even the same type of sensor observation that one company is kind of having with it and the same, let's say, temperature sensor. So they have a temperature sensor, it's making some observations. Let's say there is company B which actually has the similar temperature sensor making the same observations. But the way you express what you're observing in the form of data, it makes a lot, lot of difference. It's harder for integration if you don't have a way of talking about, if you don't have a common shared understanding of the data. And in order to have a common shared understanding of data, there are some standards. And those standards are these two standards that are here. You can look it up if you're interested. So the idea is uh, if you follow these standards and you say that I have these many sensors and I'm using these standards to publish the data, the consumption of that data becomes a lot easier. And that's the goal of integration. The second important problem is interpretation. So we have these lot of sensor observations, right? So what is the interpretation of these sensor observations? How, what is it, what is it important? How is it important? So to give you an example, we had a weather related uh, project. So in that our goal was to find out weather related events. And one of them, one of the weather related events that interests most of us is blizzard, because you don't want to go out when you have some blizzard, right? So the interpretation is something which involves uh, kind of domain knowledge. That is, if you know the domain knowledge of weather, you can say what's a blizzard. And for example, uh, there is a standard definition of blizzard, so it should have freezing temperature, obviously, then there should be snow, snow precipitation, and there should be high wind speed, and all these three things should last for, let's say, two hours. So that's the kind of definition I'm getting from a domain expert, that is, who's a weather expert. And in order to interpret the raw sensor observations, I need to have that knowledge so that I can make sense of this raw observations. And that's the idea of interpretation. Is it clear? And scale. Uh, so we, we spoke about scale. I don't want to stress more on that. And the idea is to make this processing and like this interpretation as push it to the edges. So if the device is able to perform most of the interpretation, that is good. If you are having a centralized uh, system where you push all the data to a central repository, then process it. Well, that's a lot of data. Um, so this is from my um, colleague who works on uh, semantic perception. And that's a loaded word. So I'll just describe what does it mean in the next few slides. So before I actually go there, so you see that semantic perception is part of interpretation. So this is where we are actually taking the raw data and processing it. <coughs> so the next few, next few slides. Yeah. Does it also, um, I guess what, was, what you just mentioned, um, active versus passive? You want to know about real-time events right now versus you want to be able to sit there and sit for it later or maybe go. Uh, where is active? Well, you, well, from what you had just said a few moments ago, okay. you were saying it's mm -hmm. like you know, um, data sitting on the server versus mm -hmm. Um, observing an event right now, like say a blizzard, it's like you would probably want to log back, A, yes, the 
has happened because certain criteria are met. But mm -hmm. if you want to say, hey, everybody stay indoors, it's really nasty outside, mm -hmm. you would want to know at that minute, not like, you know, five, ten, two hours later. Yes, there is a real time aspect to that. Mm -hmm. When I say intelligence to the edges, yeah. it means that this interpretation of life can happen at a centralized place. That is, there are different weather stations that are connect, collecting this information, and all of them are streamed to a central server. And this central server should take care of many of such systems. And as you say, if it's real time, it's always better for pushing it to the edge. That is, the weather station by itself, if it could figure out that there is a blizzard and just send that alert as opposed to sending all the data. So that's the kind of idea of this. And that kind of hints at like, you know, a, a blizzard in Ohio has nothing to do with Colorado. Yes. So it's, it's also a localization. Yes. Yes. True. Yeah. yeah, to just stress this point, I'm going to the interpretation part and I'll be describing the semantic perception. And this work is from my colleague, Cory Hansen. Just to motivate the problem, right? So just one flight from, there's just a cross-country flight on a 737 plane to generate 240 terabytes of data. Just one flight. And these, these, I mean, these data points are from different sensors that are monitoring different parameters of the data. So it might be engine, or it might be the flow of air, or it might be fuel, and things like that. <coughs> and as Bakshet mentioned, we can see that we don't have place to store all this data. Okay? It's kind of surpassed the storage capacity. So we have to be a bit more smart in processing this kind of scale that we have here. So one of the, the key ideas of uh, perception is you observe the real world, and there are certain things that you observe. That is, for example, the color of the table. So I observe the color and I observe the shape of the table. So those are the kind of observations you make. But what you perceive is the actual object. It is, I perceive a chair, I perceive a table. So that's the level that you're elevating from a lot of data, that is a lot of raw data to something that makes sense. That is, a table would make sense to me. And if you tell me that some na nanometer of this wavelength that's being reflected from this table and the height of the table and I mean, a lot of things, there are a lot of details, but still what matters to me most is what is it? That's exactly what is perception. And we have these objects in the real world and what we perceive is actually a replica of it in the sense that we don't have, I don't have a chair, chair or table in my head, but still I could perceive it. I know I could relate it, what is there in the physical world through this perception <coughs> process. So this is this process is called abstraction, and that's the idea of this. So as I told you, having these abstractions would, uh, would be a lot easier. So just now I gave you an example of this table and chair, right? So if I'm talking to another person, if I say, oh, I need, uh, uh, let's say, uh, I, I saw a chair and a table, then it would make a lot more sense for him, as opposed to me telling uh, the wavelength was this, the height was that, the breadth was that. So I mean, you can see that there is so much detail involved. I need not communicate all the details to that person. I just tell them table and chair. And that's the kind of key part for abstraction. So that's the idea. And, and humans are really good at it. I mean, we have evolved these kind of skills of perceiving things, uh, and nothing can beat it. Because though there is so much complexity involved, that is, I have so many sense on it. Like I have my vision, I have sound, then I have taste, I have touch. So all these sensor observations are just thrown at me, but still I could make sense of these different things around me and different people around me. So we have evolved that perception inherently and we don't consciously register when we actually do this, uh, but still it's a very complex process.
So the idea of this uh, project that my senior is pursuing uh, is to actually take these ideas of perception, whatever you could see in humans. Uh, not that we know everything, but at least some of the ideas. It's motivated by the ideas of human perception. And see if you can imitate it in a machine and make a machine perceive things in the real world. So that's the idea of this, uh, this project. So as I told you, uh, both machines and uh, humans are capable of uh, perceiving quality, such as this color of this wavelength, right? My eyes can detect it as well as, let's say, a sensor, which could detect the wavelength can actually detect the color or maybe the wavelength of the light. So both humans and machines can actually make those uh, physical uh, observations. So the example here is the redness, right? So both I can observe redness and the machine can actually observe redness. So as I told you, if I have to associate these different observations that I make to some physical object, I need to have some prior knowledge of it. That is, I should know that, for example, in this case, apples are red, right? Are the other characteristics, like apples are red, brown, right? They might have a green like that. So all these different uh, knowledge that you actually possess about the world is very important in moving from observations, that is, qualities, to physical objects. So, as humans, we have already evolved and we have this knowledge within us. Like we have knowledge about how to detect an apple, right? But for machines, it's not. It's not, it's not natural for machines. So we need to explicitly state what exactly is this object made of and what to expect. What are the qualities to expect for this physical object? So that kind of encoding is required for, uh, in order for machines to uh, perceive physical objects. And this is just telling that we can engage in perception cycle, for example. And talk about what's perception cycle. Let me just skip this. So here is a quick description of what do you what do I mean by perception cycle? So we kind of have an idea of perception by now. Like finding of physical objects based on the qualities that you observe. The perception cycle involves a bit more uh, cyclic, it's a cyclic, it's a cyclic process. That is, a, an observer observes a quality, right? And it sends, um, so it sends observation to the perceiver. So observer can be our eyes, for example. And perceiver can be our brain. So I, my eyes observes the color and sends that observation to the perceiver. And the brain actually figures out what next to observe. That's the most important feature uh, that is kind of, uh, it's a characteristic of the perception cycle. So now it sends the focus, that is what next to observe, to the observer. Like for example, like eye movements are made up of hundreds and uh, maybe a few hundreds of quick movements. So if I'm looking at an object, I'm actually painting, I'm looking at different parts of the object to actually paint the whole picture of it. So that's the kind of idea of perception cycle, where I send the focus, what next to observe, and the observer observes the next quality. And this process continues, and it's a cycle. And there is a whole uh, kind of formalization of these things in set theory kind of framework. So this system <coughs> is a lot, we have used uh, this piece of research in many other uh, applications that I'll talk about in the next few slides. So now we saw that, uh, so this, I'm switching gears a little, so this is like uh, the first one, we saw that there's so much of data generated by these physical objects, like the aircraft, for example. So how much of data is actually generated monitoring the pilot? If you think about it, it's very less. So right now, there are no sensors actually monitoring the health of a pipe, except for maybe few sensors. Well, the idea is to 
execute the same uh, meticula meticulous control and monitoring we have for these physical objects, can we do it for humans? That is, if someone is interested to uh, kind of monitor themselves for better performance or healthcare kind of things, so is it possible for us to do a similar analysis on healthcare and data? And that's one of the projects that uh, we are working on. So there are many sources of such uh, healthcare information. Uh, some of them are like medical records, such as EMR records that have all this history of uh, diseases and like, basically symptoms, diseases, and patient history and things like that. There is medical background knowledge on the web. The, this is a very big field. So there is so much data on the web and so much knowledge on the web. You can actually leverage those things to do such an analysis over healthcare data streams. And nowadays, social networks are getting uh, involved in healthcare discussions. For example, patients like me. So there is this whole healthcare discussion uh, forum where people ask for different suggestions. And so, of course, there are uh, personal observations are something and uh, something like you observe something and you are interested in some uh, finding out what a symptom would be and things like that. Uh, there are different sensors that are suitable for monitoring health of uh, physiological parameters of people. So, these different mobile devices and different sensors plays a crucial role when, when it comes to monitoring healthcare. And we have a project on this, and uh, the project deals with collecting physiological observations, that is heart rate, uh, then there is weight monitoring like this, that's another thing. and there is um, temperature. So there are these different physiological parameters that you can uh, monitor. And the idea is to use uh, the perception cycle that I was talking about, the initial part, to actually analyze these different data streams. So unfortunately, all the data that you collect would look like this. Remember I was giving you an example of this chair, <coughs> right? So there are different details that are involved. But if you just throw me at, at the, I mean, all these charts, right, it becomes a lot harder for me to make sense out of it. I can make sense out of it, but I need to invest more time and I, I might not have all the knowledge to decipher this. For example, uh, there is some variation in, uh, let's say, weight, for example. There is a change in weight of two pounds a day, all of a sudden. And let's say I, I'm, I might think that, oh, I might have had a lot of food. But if you are able to combine some domain knowledge that I was talking about of medical records, like the background knowledge here. So you can actually see what are the other interpretations of gaining gain weight. So there are these uh, subtle things that are uh, very important when it comes to processing these things. So what makes more sense to humans is the most important thing. As opposed to <coughs> presenting these charts, uh, let's say I present, present some abstractions. Right? And that would be a lot more useful. And the abstraction can be some piece of actionable information. That is, maybe you, you ask the person to drink more water, something like that. So that's the kind of abstraction that I'm talking about. Any questions? So how do we accomplish all these things? And for sure, we need to integrate different sensors. I spoke about heterogeneity. Uh, then we need to bridge this gap of physical cyber kind of divide. And we need to elevate the abstractions. We don't want to talk too much detail. We always talk at the abstract level. And of course, scale is the another uh, challenge that we have. This, uh, this just shows that semantic work kind of extends the all throughout the hierarchy. So at the top you have the experiential part. And that's what we actually, that's the vision that I spoke about when I started. So here is another project. Uh, so using the perceptions, I'll just quickly tell you three lines. Uh, 
using the perception cycle work that I described, so they found that there were some uh, problems with the EMR records, and there were some uh, they detected some missing knowledge, and that's that's one of the projects that my other friend is working on. The other piece is coming. So now I'll just describe uh, another piece of uh, uh, projects that we have, and uh, this is somewhat related to describing the sensor itself. Remember I mentioned when you have these sensors wide you know, across the globe, you may want to search for sensors, but you may have some constraints when you search. For example, I might be interested in cameras on a highway with a particular resolution. I don't want some low resolution image. So in that case, I need to be able to describe these sensors so that at a later stage I can ask pointed questions and ask these uh, <coughs> impose these constraints on the search query that I'm actually making. So there are different, these are different, uh, you can just talk to me if you're interested in these uh, description of sensors and things like that. So I would just skip these slides now, but I would be very happy to talk if anyone is interested in this part. Um, so, there is this uh, huge initiative of uh, coming up with a common uh, understanding. So remember in the first few slides I spoke about integration and use of standards for integrating uh, data across different uh, platforms, right? And there is this huge initiative with uh, similar initiative with sensors. That is, they have a standard way of describing sensors so that that standard way is common across different uh, people who are using that uh, kind of description so that they can exchange information in a uh, seamless fashion. Uh, and we have published a lot of data uh, related to weather uh, on linked open data. So linked open data is this initiative where people are taking all the data they have and they are publishing it on the web. And it includes governments, it includes companies. Uh, so all these big government agencies and companies, they want to make or empower citizens with all this data. And linked open data is a way of connecting up pieces of data on the web and publishing all this data. And we have done, uh, there, is other, there are other projects which actually specifically focuses on uh, linked open data. So one of the demos that I'll show would be where there is a search interface and you type in the name as opposed to platform to search for sensor. And that's a lot more intuitive for the So let me give you some demo. Search query results in a particular sensor being displayed. So you just this this interface is available. You can talk to me, but it's kind of local, right? So that sensor is getting displayed there. And if you want more details, you just click on the sensor, and it will give you all the current observations that are made. Uh, so these are the observations that are made by the sensor. So since I have uh, many demos, I would go quickly with this. So you saw that that's a weather domain. So that's a kind of uh, demo that you saw. We also have an interdisciplinary project where we have a robot collecting sensor observations and detecting different types of fires. So this was a collaborative project with the electrical engineering department. And I'll just show you the demo. So, so 
there are uh, different sources of information, that is different sources of observations. So think about these sources of observations being used in processing information from a sensor on board on a robot. So if the robot is empowered to connect to the web, right? So it, it brings in a lot more avenues for improvement. And one of the things we did was we took a Roomba robot. How many of you are from electrical machinery? Okay. So we took the Roomba robot and we actually had these different types of sensors, Sense, uh, like temperature sensor, uh, we had carbon monoxide sensor, then we had carbon dioxide sensor, oxygen sensor, uh, IR sensors. So this is the robot that's in the center. Here are the raw sensor observations. That is, like these, too much details, right? And these are the abstractions. And there is a symbolic representation of the abstraction. That is, like no fire abstraction. So you, at some point, you will actually see a fire. There. So the robot is now navigated close to the place where there is some local fire created. So obviously, we cannot create big fire in the building. So, <laughs> so you can see that. The robot is very close to the fire, so it detects the temperature rise, it detects the carbon dioxide level, and all these observations right now are streamed to a small device and it's being processed on that. Did you see the abstraction? see that how interdisciplinary these things can be, right? So the knowledge representation and like those different standards I was talking about, it's not disconnected from real world things like a small robot. So here, uh, so you can see that uh, there is a heater. It actually detects the room heater, oops. So there are so you can see that there is a heater here, so it kind of detects the heater. The distinguishing factor would be uh, there is no carbon dioxide or no light. Yeah, that's the kind of distinction. Okay, so that's one of the demo I had. Uh, I have, we have a bunch of other demos, so just stop by the office, please feel free. I could not convey everything that I wanted to because we have so much work done in this, in this project. I could just give you a glimpse of things. Uh, what if you had like a fireplace? Would it be able to distinguish that that's like a safe fire? Yeah, that's yeah. a very good question. So let's say if you have somehow localized your robot, let's say you can say that this particular robot is in this location, and fireplace is probably uh, at one location in your house. So in that case, you can associate whatever fire you're detecting to a fireplace. And if there is a distinguishing factor, such as, let's say, uh, different objects emit different uh, kind of radiation, that is, the wavelength, and also the gases that they actually release are different. So if you're able to have those sensors which can detect such distinctions, then you can make some distinction. And there are different types of fire, like type A, type B, and things like that. Um, I think wood burning is kind of one type of fire versus some liquid actually is on fire, oil on fire. So those are the different types of fires. And the way you distinguish is to actually take sensors that can actually measure that physical quality, which is important. That is distinguishing. Yeah? It doesn't even detect various chemicals in the air. It also detects various harm things in the gas leak or uh, I got the initial part, like, your question was to... Basically, these things can detect harmful chemicals in the air. Maybe you can also detect something that's not actually harmful in the air, but so let's say there's four forms nearby, or what the hell you have to do with this time, like, actually breaking off, or just like, you know, like a state. Sure, yeah, yeah. So, it depends on how sensitive your sensor is. So, you can potentially have... Uh, so the system is only limited by the capability to sense. So you can plug in any type of sensor, and it gives you all the power because you can leverage the knowledge on the web 
and also your own knowledge of the domain. And that's the kind of power you get with this kind of system. And yes, you can sense, if you want to sense something really sensitive, very subtle, then you can, if, if your sensor enables it. Does it answer your question? So here is a picture of the robot that you close to your robots. So there are a bunch of sensors in the front of the All these observations are processed <coughs> and elevated to a certain abstraction. And this is another yeah. Why do we need a robot for this? Why do we need this? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. So let's say there are static sensors in some building, right? So let's say the building is on fire. So it, it might happen that there may be some sensors in the building which are kind of damaged. So now you want to know the condition within the building. So in that case, you can send the robot inside to kind of survey the place. Uh, this is probably a use case. And there can be multiple use cases. Robot is one, but you also see this vest here. So this is not for a robot, this is for a human, right? So if a firefighter wears such a thing, and you can monitor not only his surroundings, but also his health, which is very crucial, and you can actually warn him if the carbon dioxide level is very high, or if there is the temperature is too high for his jacket to kind of withstand. So you can do multiple uh, kind of, there's no limit, and it's pretty good, and this is a very exciting uh, project, so you guys, if you're interested, I'd be very happy to uh, take this off my yeah. Question I think about is this technology very similar where they use like various probe missions in space to report information of atmosphere conditions, what goes on in the layer, what's what, what's up for So your question is if this can be this, I mean, I'm asking is this is anything similar because I keep hearing about it, I keep thinking it's very similar to what like a Mars probe would be or a rogue or sort of this would be. Um I, so the idea of, uh, so the one distinguishing factor from what you stated and what the system is, is that in this case we are leveraging knowledge from the web. And that's the key part. Uh, so the thing is something like, uh, in case of, um, let's say fire, right? So there are descriptions of different types of fire on Wikipedia. And there is a, Another form of Wikipedia called DBpedia. How many of you have heard of it? So it's just machine readable form of Wikipedia. That is, it's expressed in a form where I can uh, make a program to read it easily. That's the idea. So all the different type of information is available on the web. So let's say if your machine wants to get some knowledge which is relevant to, let's say, firefighting for now. So it can get it from that location and it can build up on the fly and actually do some analysis. So that's the goal of such a system. And that's the distinguishing factor. Uh, there is this another exciting project. Uh, I was talking here about the health of the pilot, right? So there is very less done to actually monitor the health of the pilot. So think about that as a example and think about actually <coughs> being able to monitor yourself with all the uh, physiological sensors that, can, that are possible. And those sensor observations are kind of explained in a way that are intuitive to humans. You can see that these questions make sense for humans. So it's basically asking for some things where the human is actually good at, where sensors can, can't actually detect some things. For example, being light <coughs> right? A sensor might not be able to detect it directly. Whereas if you ask a human, he might have that uh, kind of uh, observation directly in his person. So the idea is to use complementary nature of sensor and human observations for such, uh, uh, for such analysis. So there is a whole project on this and the idea is to find out if a person is, uh, uh, so the idea is to uh, actually minimize the admissions. So hospital readmissions has become a big issue, and it's costing billions of dollars every year in the U.S. Uh, in the U.S. So now the government has removed support for uh, hospital for hospitals, which has a lot of readmissions. 
So the question is, can you use such system to minimize these deviations by analyzing the sensor observations and alerting the person well before it's too late? So that's the idea of this uh, project. So this project involves Android UI kind of application building. It also has a backend. So the backend uh, is mostly, if you're interested, you can explore the back backend as well. Uh, you, but it's mostly Android kind of things. I'll propose two uh, projects in the end, and that involves this kind of uh, application. Uh, so we have this another project called uh, Samo. So the idea is all these mobile devices that uh, Dr. mentioned initially, they have onboard sensors. There are like five to six sensors on your Android phone, any smartphone. Uh, which includes accelerometer, GPS, uh, then maybe it has a touch screen and based, it, it has a uh, compass. There are these different kinds of sensors. So not only reporting the local sensor observations, but there may be sensors surrounding the device. So can these devices connect to this mobile device and use mobile device as a platform to analyze these sensor observations? So that's the idea of this project. So you can see that there are different types of sensors. So these different types of sensors connect to a mobile device. And there is a whole system, uh, which I don't want to go into details now. Uh, but this system is capable of registering new sensors. That is, let's say this sensor is connected to a mobile device. This device can actually connect to the system through the mobile device. And this system is capable of making registrations. And at a later stage, if I ask the system, OK, give me all the sensors that are registered with you, so it can answer such questions. And it can also answer questions like, uh, uh, give me all the sensors which are capable of measuring temperature. So that those are the kind of questions that you can ask to these systems. So overall, the idea is to come up with these uh, abstractions for first responders. So if you situate this whole application in the context of firefighting, for example, so all these sensors might be on a vest or a jacket that the firefighter is kind of having. And this mobile device might be carried by the uh, firefighter. And these things might be constantly streaming data to this, this system here. And the first responders would get actionable information as opposed to raw sensor observation. And when I say actionable, it should be something like type of fire. Because different type of fire might need different types of extinguishers, right? So if the person is well prepared or the responder is well prepared, it's, uh, it's better. <coughs> That's the kind of idea. And we use, again, data from the web to process these uh, observations. There are some details of uh, what exactly is the kind of reasoning. Just don't go into details, just look at this name here. So you go from lat long to that name, and you do that using uh, open data on the web. So there may not be anyone actually sitting there and finding out what is the lat long in the place. The data is already available on the web. So that's kind of leveraging things on the web to reason over the observations that you have. And this is the overall system, how it looks like. So whatever you saw was kind of the backend in the front end. So this is the user interface. And you have a map. And you have these sensors. Sensors are kind of shown as a push pin. And this is the query interface. That is, you can make, you can ask questions what I was talking about here in this place. And there is a, there is the Android application that sits on the Android phone. And you can use your, uh, the, all these things are protected so you can only the, Authoritative person can log in and actually report sensors, sensor observations, report sensors and sensor observations. So that's how the overall uh, system is, looks like. Uh, so this I just described in like a few lines. I think I don't want to go into too many details. So traffic has become a major issue, right? So in most of the uh, cities, it's like. Uh, the most pressing problem. So the idea is to now, as initially when I started talking, I spoke about sensors monitoring uh, traffic, that is vehicular traffic, right? So what is the use of doing that? And 
can we use that information for better actions? That is, can the first responders or the authoritative uh, sources or government agencies, can they take some action? Can they correct the policy? Is there anything that has to be changed in the policy and things like that? So to answer those questions, you can use the sensor observations that are coming from uh, the sensors that are monitoring flow of traffic. And I'll just show you one interesting results, I think. So some of the questions you can ask to a city authority, just don't, just ignore the table when I'll just tell you what it is. So just say you <coughs> want to ask some questions, something like, give me all the locations in Dayton that are prone to accidents. And give me all the locations in Dayton uh, that are prone to weather-related accidents. So those are the questions you can ask to the system. And once you ask these questions, and if you get these answers right, you can deploy units based on, uh, deploy, deploy units in a sense like cops or take some corrective actions, maybe send some trucks that spray more salt and things like that. So you can take such actions based on uh, the observations, <coughs> that, based on the analysis that you do over these observations. And this is like a small piece that sits with that. So, now, machine sensors are there observing these different things, but people also talk about traffic-related things, right? How many of us complain about traffic and things like that? So, if it's a very crowded place, there may be some, uh, there is some information like this. So this is exactly what we saw. So, we saw a traffic jam in a place, and there is this, uh, there is this entity actually reporting some uh, accident. So, no, it's not an accident. So it's just telling that the traffic is slow. And there is an overturn semi. So it's an accident. So you can see that there are there are benefits of combining two sources of information. One is machine sensor, the other one is human uh, kind of observations. And human kind of observations are more intuitive. If I just tell you slow moving traffic, it's fine. And you know that it's slow moving traffic, but you don't necessarily know uh, what is the reason for it. And the reason is exactly here. And this is just uh, evidence for that. We found a news article about that actually. Um, coming to the last part of the uh, talk. So I have some, uh, so this is from my team. So we have different projects. So if you're interested, just, I'm sure you'll be interested because it's an exciting project. You can just stop by, just talk to us. So we have many people in the team, so you can just talk and see what you like, and depending on that, you can get some projects. So whoever is interested in Android development or developing user interfaces, it's a very good project to work on. Uh, so there are two places where we need uh, uh, sensor interfacing and interface design. Uh, one of them is the healthcare project. The other one is SEMMOB that I described as the mobile devices and bunch of sensors. And there's another uh, thing that uh, we, were talk, we were thinking about. Um, so, just this, this part is mostly visualization. That is, given these traffic sensors observations in a city, can we visualize it in real time? That is, let's say if these, the height of the bar represents the delay, right? So can, can you represent it in such a way so that it's intuitive for a human to look at it and say, oh, there's a lot of delay in this place. And maybe also catch some anomalies in that process. Those are the two project ideas I had and thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, and I would like to take any questions if you guys have. <coughs> yeah. So I'm based on sense two areas that you're actually requesting help in will be the medical the medical area and the traffic observation area or any uh, yeah, like there are two components. One is the Android based project and that involves bunch of them, like two projects. And the other one is mostly using thematic mapping. So that's the kind of uh, KML and the basically visualization of geospatial data. Those are the two projects that I'm kind of proposing. And feel free to propose any other project if you guys like. You can just stop by, talk to us. If you think that there's a potential for you to kind of explore some new areas, you can do that too. But uh, Android development is one area which we are actually looking for. 
And in that dashboard, what you're going to show is what, what is the volume of that, what is the trend of it. Because users will have interest, right? For example, right now, uh, we have Romney and Obama's uh, now debate coming up, right? I'm sure all of you are aware of that. So what is going on in that, right? It may not be picked up maybe by the system as the most important thing, but uh, you might be interested to explore. So that's the, that's the way we want to provide as an exploratory uh, dashboard where you can put the topical keyword and search um, in that, like trends for that, trends for the users, then like what are the sentiment for the users, what are the emotions for that users, things of that nature. That's what, where we want to go through. So in this project, what you will be doing is essentially creating this user interface. So you guys learned about server-side scripting, you guys learned about client-side scripting like JavaScript, Ajax, Right? So we will using these technologies. So you saw the Twitter's interface. So we have stacks available for you to come and play with. Uh, what all you need to do is using the technologies like JavaScript, Ajax, and like one server-side scripting, you might do PHP. We have database already. Everything is set up in that sense. You have to do is creating the script uh, to create to support this dashboard. So that will be your task. So um, yeah, the, you guys have like uh, six weeks to do the project. So I think it will be something to learn really how advanced analysis is done, like uh, how you go about research and analytics, as well as like how to really design a system when you are kind of designing. So like it will be helpful for your job if you want to pursue jobs after you know the graduation. So uh, that's the kind of idea in the first project that we have. Second, community contest. So uh, let's go by example first. So Romney and Obama both are talking, right? And their supporters, they are also talking um, on the social media, right? All these human senses giving different uh, pieces of information. And uh, we are, so in the first project, we were trying to understand as a whole what is happening. Here, what we are trying to do is slice and dice. That's the, that's the idea. Can we slice and dice the data in a way that we make sense, more meaningful sense. Machines can make more meaningful sense for, uh, for us to understand, to perceive the things better. So in this project, what we want to do is, let's suppose if Romney and Obama, uh, their campaigns are talking about certain issue, woman issue, job issue, immigration issue, um, foreign policy issue, all, all sorts of issues which are like of national interest, right? So for them, people are talking about, as well as uh, they by themselves, like their team, the accounts of Romney and Obama, they are themselves tweeting about it all, right? Like what they think, what is their stand. So in this, we will emphasize the differences in their commenting. So what it will eventually help, it, it will eventually help a viewer of understanding <coughs> the whole social stream which is going on from the perspective of putting the lenses of how Obama's campaign or Democrats' campaign is uh, trying to uh, take the stand, how the Republicans are trying to take a stand about an issue. So this is kind of, again, going to analytics, but, you know, again, slicing and dicing the data, like how, you know, go about, how do you do research, essentially. So in this, we'll be exploring the slicing and dicing nature of the uh, data. So let me take you to the user input. Will, you know, make more sense there. Uh, so, here, so you guys would have seen this network analysis where you guys would be seeing all these different communities um, and the clusters of users and how these users affiliate there and so on and so forth, right? So, a question to ask, right? After looking at this, uh, all right, who is this? Who is this user? Who is like at the really center of the or the core of this cluster? Who is that? All right, what is this thing? What he's really trying to do, he's talking about Obama, he's belonging to the uh, Democratic Party. Oh, is it a really a critical user who is, who is commenting about a uh, lot of critics about the Republicans? Who's that? So understanding the data uh, by slicing and dicing, and then giving you know the meaningful uh, interpretation of the data, that's the key of this second project. So here's an example. Let's look at this example. So these were like two uh, uh, networks that we created, um, <coughs> three networks that we created uh, during Occupy Wall Street movement. And how users were talking about, um, 
about different like uh, Republicans, Democrats, and Tea Party, and uh, what were their affiliations? What were uh, what what was their you know um, like profession? What profession they were belonging to? So that we could understand. Oh, politicians. Oh, journalists. Oh, no, 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 no. Business folks are actually supporting or talking about really uh, this particular stand. Tea Party stand. So now. So you see the differences in the structure of these networks, and these networks are created based on the interaction between the users. So they are users, we are communicating between each other, so that's how we create the network. So these are that kind of network, not the static friend relationship network. Uh, so on Twitter, how you communicate, based on those communication patterns, we draw these networks. In these networks, then you go and see, oh, what are this, the, we see these differences in this network. Well, well, these differences, how these differences came up, can we understand why these differences are coming? So can we understand what these users are really talking about here versus what users are really this aspire in this sparsely connected network? So that's the kind of idea that we're trying to have. That you can have a couple of communities. If I give you those, so uh, in this project, we'll just go uh, by two communities. Like take example of two communities, one for Tea Party and one for Republicans. And Tea Party is, is really clustered versus this is like really sparse. And now we are trying to reason about it, that why it's such a dynamics we are seeing. So you will understand how to uh, analyze the data, understand the data, slice and dice the data when you go about researching that particular thing. And uh, also we learn about how to uh, really create this network. Like, so we have this already built, you can see that. But uh, we, you have to essentially <coughs> put in this one like, so this will be a project. We give you uh, some initial seed nodes, but uh, from those uh, uh, seed parts, you have to kind of go and create a dashboard kind of system. Like on a browser, you show network one here, network two here. Uh, below that, you show the <coughs> clouds, and then those stack clouds, you contrast the patterns between what we're talking, being talked about in one community versus what we're being talk, being talked about in other communities. And like this community can be built around many, many facets. Like, um, so we will discuss like who is interesting. So for both these projects, our uh, idea will be two teams uh, part uh, participating like for them, and each team consisting of like three people. So that uh, three people or two people, depending on interest, like who is interest. So you guys are welcome to question. And like quickly the. Um, Third project. The third project is about um, the extension of the first part, where uh, you saw the dashboard in the first part. Remember, the first part we talked about the dashboard for so the topic. Now, why don't we explore it by human experience? The human experience here in the emotion. Like, can we uh, exploit the data from emotion? So, in our first project, we had the um, what are the what are the analysis for a given topic, right? You are trying to do uh, with various analysis. But in the third project, uh, we will kind of help you in this analysis, but we will kind of have you um, visualize that emotion part, like given, uh, given a term, quickly analyze the emotion part and show it. So basically, there will be the server side uh, backend uh, where the model will be already established how to compute the emotion, and that will bring up. Um, immediately compute and bring up the motion, and you guys will be presented essentially on the UI. So that's that's what we have. So these three projects. So we have like in mind what we have is like uh, um, three people in a team, and technologies like client uh, technologies like JavaScript and Ajax, right, and HTML of course. You guys will be doing HTML like so, and then um, like one server side scripting and CHP or PHP. So in the next class, as you know, next class is project proposal class. So you guys are welcome to think about it and form a team and come to us. Or if you have ideas, bring your ideas in like two slides. And next class, you can present us if you have your own idea. So you need to start preparing your team right away, think of your topics right away. You don't have much time. The longer it takes for you to decide what you're going to do, the less time you can have in the project. Um, projects needs to be substantial. Um, and uh, so, uh, if you have less time if you have a mini project, then I guess that will reflect in your way. Uh, so, then I think we need to work very hard and um, swiftly uh, to come up with a project description. We have to be written down description, we have to have clear commitment 
if there are three members in the team, who will do what? Soon come up with an architecture diagram, identify all the software that you're going to use, uh, who's going to give, uh, you know, get what help, where you're going to get data from, where you're going to post it, what is your test cases, uh, what are the milestones, all these things go into developing a project we need to start doing it now. Uh, as soon as I send it, please submit it. But it's just no, uh, not a single day of your time left that you know. So don't think, don't postpone this job. Um, if you can't form the team yourself, so ideal thing is that you form the team yourself. Uh, if you know some members uh, here that you want to get together, great. If that does not happen, declare your <coughs> project. Uh, you can stop by 380 uh, and talk to any of these guys to ask more questions about what are the roles available. Uh, first mover, uh, remember first mover's advantage. You commit that on this project, I want to do this thing, most likely you will get that uh, uh, job compared to somebody else who comes later and then, you know, later on, would have to do what is left to be done, which may make your job harder. Right? And or and or the simplest. So get on it very fast. Uh, if none of these projects uh, are interesting to you, now one of the things he discussed was a search engine related to uh, you know social data. If uh, none of these projects interest uh, then uh, your default project would be a search engine, a uh, basic search engine for documents. So um, after the next class, the one after that would be when we will give you uh, insights into indexing techniques, technologies and such. Uh, so probably your indexing are the two things that are fundamental to uh, creating search engines. And then we can do a you know, basic web search engine kind of thing. So here is a set of documents, you know, create a search engine, uh, basically which indexes all the key phrases in the document um, and then ranks the documents. So, uh, finding the relevant documents and then ranking. These are the two fundamental things of search engine. You need to figure out a way to develop such a search engine. And that kind of project can be also done in three, uh, uh, you know, in a group of three, I think. Uh, sometimes we can have four people, sometimes we can have two people. Uh, on these existing projects, if necessary, you may be able to have a smaller team of two people or two. Uh, remember, many of you got extensive help in doing your assignment. And uh, should you work on these projects that uh, you know, promote, that promote, that others discuss, discuss uh, you can get help. Um, and you can uh, you know, leapfrog in uh, your development capabilities. A few of you already have recent exposure and programming skills and you're able to do whatever you like. Others will need a lot of So you need to start planning that. Anything else? Any question? Each of the team that if they get formed, because from now we start creating a Google Doc. And we'll be sharing the Google Doc with uh, my assistants and me uh, as we go so we can look up and comment later on the Google Doc. Thanks, everyone.